tonight we're going to talk about preemptibles. Specifically, data proc preemptibles. Okay, preemptible nodes, which are now called secondary nodes, but we'll refer to them as preemptible and secondary interchangeably, as people might not be familiar. A data proc preemptible node is very much like a regular worker node in that it gets the same amount of CPU, memory, and network throughput, but it does not get uh, physical disks or persistent disks attached to it. That's an important distinction in Hadoop where HDFS uses the persistent disk attached to the nodes. Uh, per Preemptible nodes are used because they're cheaper, considerably cheaper, and because we don't have sustained or persistent Hadoop clusters, um, we don't get sustained use discounts, so preemptible nodes are ideal to save cost because the idea is that you get the same amount of computational horsepower without the persistent disk. However, preemptible nodes are cheaper because it's a contract with Google that they can remove them or shut them down and replace them anytime they want. So let's say you create a Hadoop cluster with 50-50 um, uh, preemptible nodes and as Google turns, uh, recoups that preemptible node it will start another one up for you but any of the tasks that are running on the node are lost. Uh, well by lost I mean they have to be restarted from scratch. Um, so, in scalding, we use scalding on MapReduce, and if you use preemptible nodes, um, you probably don't know that they're being preempted, because MapReduce does handle this well by default. Um, however, your jobs are probably running a lot longer uh, with the preemptible nodes than they would without. So, for example, let's say you had a uh, MapReduce job where the re you had really long tail reducers, you know, 20 minutes to an hour, and there are a lot of them. And that reducer is running on a, pre a preemptible node. Well, let's say Google preempts the node, uh, and that reduce task will start over. Well, you've, you know, let's say you were at minute 40 of an hour long reduce task. You know, your, your job's waiting at least an additional 40 minutes to move on. So that's really the detriment. Um, Chris's opinion, my opinion, is that we shouldn't use preemptible nodes at all, um, especially in MapReduce, because uh, you know the, the the jobs are running a lot longer, and then they become uh, unpredictable in in run length. You could take the same data set, run the same job twice, and get you know, wildly different run times. So SLAs are not predictable. And, and um, expectations are unpredictable, and who knows, maybe we pay more in some circumstances. If you, if you have a Hadoop cluster with more than 50% of the nodes are preemptible, we might actually be paying more for that job because it takes so much longer to run. All right, so those are preemptible nodes. They're, they're cheaper, but Google can take them away at any time. And I think the idea behind preemptible nodes was that this should happen rarely. It happens a lot. Start up a Hadoop job, uh, a Maverick scalding job in ad hoc, and watch yarn. Those nodes are getting yanked out like within the first minute of the job running. And I don't care how many preemptible nodes you, you have in there. It happens a lot. Okay, preemptible nodes, and the one attribute that's different to remember is that they don't have persistent disks. Um, so in MapReduce, that um, not, I don't think many of the jobs use HDFS, but let's say you use a scalding uh, method like force to disk, which kind of triggers a new MapReduce job in a new stage. Um, that does use HDFS, and HDFS is Hadoop Distributed File System, and it uh, rides on top of the persistent disks of the um, of the primary nodes. Um, not object storage, not GCS. 
So secondary workers don't provide any additional um, capacity to HDFS. Um, I don't think it's a big deal in, in MapReduce and Scalding. It's a huge um, deal in Spark. Um, okay, so secondary worker slash preemptible nodes and uh, back to the topic of those getting yanked out frequently. Uh, MapReduce by default survives that pretty well, but the jobs are in long. Um, Spark does not handle it well by default. However, you can make Spark handle it very well with um, some some workarounds. And uh, I shouldn't say workarounds. I mean, you, you're going to code specifically under the assumption that the job runs with preemptibles. So... The, so the reason why um, MapReduce handles that a little better by default is that MapReduce is broken up into MapReduce stages. They're separate MapReduce jobs, and the data has to get written out to each one. So let's say that your your scalding job is a DAG of seven MapReduce jobs. It's not like if job number six starts getting preempted by, by Google um, that it has to start over from job number one again. It just has to start over with the data for job number six. Spark, on the other hand, um, doesn't, uh, you know, the reason why it's faster is it does all of those stages um, kind of uh, in one job and it shuffles the data between active workers rather than starting and stopping MapReduce jobs. So, um, again, let's say you had uh, a job with, uh, a Spark job that had eight stages and you had preemptible workers that started hitting, you know, starting getting preempted in stage seven, um, yeah, Spark may actually need to rerun the computations of stages two, three, four, five, and six um, in order to make up for that. Um, and it hurts. And, and the Spark job will, by default, you know, retry like three times uh, at different points, and it'll probably fail uh, or appear to run forever. But the way to handle that in Spark is to checkpoint. So checkpoint is similar to Scalding's force to disk. It's saying, hey, after I finish, say, stage four of my eight stage job, I'm gonna do dot checkpoint in my data frame. And so you have to set up a checkpoint directory as a, uh, a um, as a task ahead of time, but it's pretty simple to do. And I think actually as a data platform team, we're gonna set up a checkpoint directory in HDFS automatically when your Spark job runs as a default configuration. But anyway, so you do that checkpoint, the Spark job will uh, materialize the data for that data frame up until the stage that you're calling checkpoint on. Uh, and then we'll write the results to disk in HDFS. So, Let's say you get to stage eight and you start getting preempted in GCS, I'm sorry, in GCP, a data proc, preemptible nodes get preempted. Um, it doesn't need to replay or rematerialize the results from stages two, three, four, or five, you know, or whatever I stopped at. It simply reads that data back out of um, HDFS again, that materialized result uh, can carry on. And so with that said, and because, if you remember yesterday's talk, how you have deterministic number of tasks, uh, deterministic parallelism and spark, you can actually leverage preemptibles to your advantage. And our, in our, um, the data platform team converted three jobs from scalding to spark. And in one of them, um, the original scalding job used like 50, 50-50 um, work, uh, primary workers and secondary workers, which was bad. And Spark actually did not handle it well out of the box, but adding a checkpointing um, call to you know, the big computation stage, we actually made the job run very fast. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it was you know, one to two hour job down to like 30 minutes in Spark. Um, and that was with using preemptibles, you know, the same cluster attributes that the scalding job had uh, and a simple call to checkpoint. Uh, it was amazing.
All right. We're back at the field. Let's go over secondary nodes slash preemptible nodes again. They had the same RAM, CPU, and network throughput that primary workers have. They cost less. And they don't have pers uh, persistent disks. Google can preempt them at any time. And based on our observation, this happens a lot. And it happens early in a job. Okay. Your scalding jobs that have a lot of, uh, you know, a high percentage of preemptible workers probably are taking a lot longer than they have to. Whether they cost less or not, who knows. And they're probably variable run times. And it has nothing to do with the data. Spark, by default, doesn't handle them very well. However, with checkpointing on your data frames, um, you can actually work very well with preemptable nodes. My, my recommendation is don't use preemptables at all. We don't want variable run times. We want predictable run times. We don't want de cost and developer troubleshooting things that aren't really breaking simply because it's preemptable. Let's just not use them. Catching some rotor off the trees. Ah, oh, there we go. Run it out, run it out, run it out. Like a glove. My motor was not preempted by Google tonight.